so there you have it, Mr. C. Um, comments on on that on that uh, short interlude with uh, Professor Hansen. Well, you know, can I can I begin with a with a um, um, a story? You know how I am as a teacher. I like to tell stories. Um, so I'm a undergraduate after retiring from the Air Force. And I'm going to what is now one of the top ranked universities in the country. In fact, uh, the dream of the man who founded it was to create the Harvard of the West, West Coast. Well, I think he, it has far exceeded his dream. Uh, they are in the top 10 universities in the country and they're public. Cal State University, San Bernardino. Check them out. You'd be surprised at where they stand in the national rankings. Um, and so I was taking an independent study class on the Romantics. Uh, that's Shelley, Keats, um, Coleridge, you know, that whole panoply, if you will, of individuals from England uh, writing in the late 18th century and early 19th century. Um, and I was having, a, because the independent study class is one-on-one -on -one with the professor, she was a distinguished writer on the genre, uh, nationally recognized. Uh, and so I had the temerity to suggest, and the reason I suggested this was because of my own life experiences of traveling the world and being in the places where I have been. Um, and so I suggested to her that with the exception of Byron and Shelley, both of whom died at a very young age, uh, Byron because he got involved in a war he shouldn't have been close to, and Shelley because he caught a disease and died as a function of that. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, he got typhoid. Um, I could be wrong. You could check me on that. Go to Google. They'll tell you. <laughs> Go to Wikipedia. <laughs> In fact, we can do it right now. Um, and so I said to her, I said, well, you know that Alan Blake and those of his group were part of the, the ruling elites, the educated elites of the time. In fact, the, they lived very good lives. They had health care when they needed it, even though by our standards it wasn't very good, but it was certainly better than what the people living in this, you know, the, the serfs and the peons were ha have, uh, and they also ate well. Oh, and they lived in these really fine homes that had gates, or they had fences around them. Uh, and so they lived very long, productive lives. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm sure, Mr. K, you like me, are a Blake fan. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest. I mean, never mind. I won't finish that. But the bottom line is, and she was offended. She was offended because I had the temerity to suggest the reason these people lived the long lives they did. For example, Blake lived to be like 88 or 89 years old uh, at a time when the average lifespan for most humans was probably their mid-30s if they were lucky. All right. Uh, in fact, for those who don't know, in 1900 in this country, the average age for Americans, men and women, was 47. And most people didn't have a high school diploma. So Shelley, Shelley drowned in a sudden storm on the Gulf of La Spezia while returning from Leghorn Livorno to La Ricci. <laughs> he shouldn't have been on the boat. And Byron got caught up in the war. Anyway, the, she, she was offended and she actually, I know it impacted my grade with her because everything I ever did for her was an A, but I ended up with an A minus because I had the temerity. To, and by the way, what kind of, what segment of society did she come from? Go ahead and guess. Go ahead. Upper middle class. Mm -hmm. Fine home. She was from Nebraska. Uh, I knew the part of Nebraska that she lived in because I, my first wife was from Nebraska. So I knew 
the state because I'd hunted all over it. And so I knew the city she came, the little town she came from. I knew the kind of people that lived there. And her father had property and as a function of property had wealth. And so she was able to go to a good university, blah, you know the drill. All right. So how does this relate to my life experience? When I was stationed in Karachi, Pakistan, uh, I had a home that was leased by the Department of State for which the Department of Defense paid for, paid the Department of States. Nothing, there is no free lunch. Um, I had a guard, I had a gardener, I had a butler, I had a babysitter. You getting a picture here? And I was a, an in, a non-commissioned officer who didn't make a lot of money. So all of these things were provided for me as a function of my service. And it protected me from some of the stuff that was going on. I took a different way to work every day, every single day, different way back home every single day. Because even in the 1970s, Pakistan was not what you would call a safe place to live. But you could say that about Detroit. You could say that about New York. You could say that about Sacramento. You could say that about <laughs> Florida. <laughs> so where's a safe place to live? In a gated community. Right. But you do have to leave a gated community and they can lob uh, grenades over the wall to gated community. Well, that's true. But can that happen? Does that happen in the United States? Uh, it could very easily. It could very easily. Absolutely. So hmm. do I am I upset that Nancy Pelosi, who can afford it, lives in a gated community in Napa? Guess what? If I could afford it, I'd live in a gated community in Napa as well. All right. So. Now let's talk a little bit about generals. Um, General Eisenhower, who, when he retired from being president, he re he would refuse to allow people to call him Mr. President. He said, "If you want to call me something be besides my first or my family name, you can call me General, but I don't want to be called Mr. President." But Eisenhower, from a very young age, he had something in common with you. Which I sent you an email today. Yes, he, was yes. a, he was a lover of books. He was a voracious reader. He couldn't get enough. And his mother just happened to have a lot of military history books in the, uh, in the home library. So he started with that and he continued on. So I, I've read, read a fair amount on Eisenhower recently. He did tank commanding training. Uh, during World War One, he was not allowed to, to go to Europe and fight, but he's not what you would call an experienced uh, battle hardened at all uh, veteran. He's a, he's a man who was who was in offices, did visit the troops, but he was planning things and making big political decisions with the people in Washington, D.C. And General Patton, with whom he did not get along, was the man on the ground who was excellent in most cases when it came to a war of movement, when it was a war like a World War I type war, and I'm not sure of Patton's record during World War I, but when it was a bogged down thing of occupying and maintaining a position, he was not very good at that. And not, I don't know how many people who, who really are, that occupying force is a very, very difficult goal. But first of all, share with us your love of books how that brought you into the military later on with the test score and what you think about Eisenhower. We'll start with him. Well, <clears throat> notwithstanding my own reading experience, it, the biggest day of my life was when I was 13 and I got my adult library card, which meant the whole library was open to me. Uh, I would pick a genre and I'd read everything on the shelf. Uh, the trick was I'd get on my bike right over the local library, come home with, with eight to 10 books. And the next Saturday I do the same thing because I would read those, those books and be done with them. It's time to get new ones. And so naturally as a part of this process, I would pick up books about the military. Some were fiction, some were fact. Uh, and then of course my dad had been a combat engineer in World War II. And although he did not talk much about his, in fact, he, I certainly understand now that I've been in combat, I understand him a whole lot better now than I did when I was uh, that teenager who was bucking the traces, as it were. Um, 
so the only thing he ever told me was about the time he lost uh, some stripes when he went to London on a 72 hour pass to get out of the combat zone. And it was after the Blitzkrieg and uh, they got a little wasted and they got a truck and wrecked it and he lost two stripes. <laughs> So the bottom line is that, you know, he, but he certainly passed on the lessons of, and, and as I said, because of my own experience, I now understand what motivated him. Um, so talking about Eisenhower, I remember discussions between my dad and my mom about Eisenhower because my dad had served under him in the European theater. Uh, and the one thing that came across to me from that discussion was how much my father respected that man as a military commander. Uh, remember what I just said a little bit ago about following General Lavelle through into hell if I had if he'd asked me to. Mm -hmm. That's the impression I got from my dad about Eisenhower. Would he have followed Patton? Yes, because Patton was the kind of commander who was on the horse in front. Well, in his case, a tank. Eisenhower would have led his troops into battle, but he would have been more like Alexander the Great. Now, I don't know how much history you know about Alexander the Great, one of the greatest military commanders. In fact, his tactics are still taught at National War Colleges around the world and they are still used in combat. Uh, another military commander who's taught in National War Colleges, Genghis Khan, <laughs> still today, okay? They were thinkers. George Patton was a doer. Give me my orders, point me in the right direction, I will salute smartly, and I will carry out the mission. Eisenhower, Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan, George Marshall, another name which you I will throw no. into the mix. No. They were the thinkers. They're not necessarily political, but they understand the game of politics and they understand what the task is they have to do as a commander. They have to win. Now, what do they have to do to win? George Washington, well, Eisenhower warned us about the military industrial complex. George Washington could have been our king, but he said two terms was enough, I'm going home. And guess what? That's what every soldier wants. Every soldier wants to go home. What does a George Patton want to do? The fact that he got killed and of course, the circumstances of that, the great George C. Scott movie leaves you with that question. Well, how did that happen? The question of his death is, is always going to be just that, a mystery. But I can assure you that had George Patton come home at the end of the war, he would have been looking for another war to get to be involved in. And he was ready for one towards the end of World War II. Yes, and, and many people agree that he was correct uh, militarily and uh, geopolitically in terms of uh, eliminating an, an enemy at the time you could, but he, it wasn't um, diplom diplomatically correct to, for an America that was fatigued and worn out after two world wars to go in and wage more war and lose more American lives. So I think it, I think Patton had enough foresight to know that the, the Soviets were going to were already a problem. We're very strong fighters. The Germans at the end of the war did not have the weapons, did not have the manpower, but the Soviets had both of those and they were much more what you would call antiquated, vicious than any of the other forces in that, that were big powers in Europe at the time. They were vicious, like the Japanese were vicious and the Chinese were vicious. The old school Soviets still had that ethic in, in the 1944, 45. I, 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 I would make a correction. I would make a correction. Uh, the word is Russian, not Soviet. I want you to think about history geopolitical history. 
Russia has been the track across which invading forces have come for centuries. Hitler, of course, as the historians all now look at what he did, didn't listen to his generals when he told when they told him, don't fight beyond your supply lines. That's what cost him the Eastern Front was his troops were out there without ammunition, without food, without fuel. Without air power, air cover too, also. Without air power and without air cover. And they were, and you remember, I, we did an email and I told you the story of the young man in my class who is a sixth generation Japanese American and the discussion of the, of the dropping of the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki came up. And so I asked Randy, who, who's certainly raised in, a, in a, a Japanese family who's cognizant of, and by the way, he is also a military veteran and, and, and a loyal American and loves this country. So when I tell, when I relate this on film, people need to understand that what he, when he answered the question I asked him in class, he was speaking from his cultural knowledge of his own ethnic identity. So the question was, Mr. Yamamoto, and uh, the, the synchronicity of that name, uh, by the way, you know what Yamamoto is, Admiral Yamamoto has been alleged to have said, I believe we have awakened a sleeping giant. No. Oh my God. Yes, he did. Um, so Mr. Mr. Yamamoto said, I said, so uh, what do you think? This say? is in the 1990s? This was in 19, no, this was the early 2000s, 2001, 2002, when I started teaching at American River College. And so I said to him, I said, so what do you think? Was, was the decision to drop the first one on Hiroshima a good decision? And he, he unequivocally says, yes. He said, what? And then I said, what about the one on Nagasaki nine days later? And he said, yes. And then I said, would you please explain to the class why you're saying yes to both? He said, because the studies, the people who did those sorts of things at that time, and he was well read on this, which really kind of caught me by surprise and made me go read some more. They had done studies about what it would take to conquer the Japanese islands. Now, for those who don't know, there's, there are, there's the main island, Honshu. Then there's a northern island, Hokkaido. And then there are some islands to the south. And then there are the islands which stretch out eventually to Okinawa. Now, what he said to me was this. He said, Every man and woman, old and young, would have taken up arms to defend their home. Now, does Japan have walls? It has no. a sea. It has yeah. a sea. It has the China Sea. It has the Pacific Ocean. But it has no walls. It has no natural barriers. So an invading force, how do you stop it? If you're the Japanese people, you enlist everybody in the combat that's going to happen. So the number, the number crunchers of that time in 1945 looked at the numbers and they said, it will take an initial force of 1 million ground forces. Now, sure, the European theater was done with the defeat of Germany. So we're going to take all of these troops out of Europe, which would have included my dad and my uncle, take them not from the European theater of operations and ship them across country. They would not have had time to stop and see their families. And send They're them already, already exhausted and uh, taking prisoners to the tune of a few million. Yes. And now you're going to send them and you're going to put them on boats because that's what you have to do to invade the Japanese islands. You have to put them on boats, landing craft, 
and you can't, well, yes, there are airborne troops, and but we can't put that in, out of a million combat forces. How many can we put on aircraft? No. So Harry Truman sat at his desk in the Oval Office, took the advice of his military commanders and made a world changing decision and brought a war to an end without further loss of American lives. And showed the Soviets and the Russians that we were ready to use those, when, whatever means we needed to use them and to stay off of the things that were outside of our agreement at the end of the war. Yes, and to also, as you may or may not be aware, you know, the Japanese had submarines off the West Coast. They also had these balloon fire bombs which struck yeah. Washington and Oregon. And then, of course, the, the Germans had U-boats off the East Coast. Uh, but our Navy was so good, they never got close. And so we considered ourselves, well, here's the bottom line. At the end of World War II, there was only one healthy nation. That was us. And of course, under the Marshall Plan, we rebuilt Europe and we built, rebuilt Japan, which brings us to MacArthur. Uh, one, one quick thing before we jump to MacArthur. The bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, August 6th, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, August 9th, four, four days apart. Yep. I said 10, didn't I? It's four nine. Days. You said no, nine. It's not nine. Yeah. Well, hey, I'm going to claim senior moments. <laughs> Too much information up here. All Sometimes right, so I want to... I want to jump in before we get to MacArthur. So Patton is a highly educated, affluent person. His father owned 1,000 acres, or might have been his grandfather. In the video, Hanson talks about this. I think it was his grandfather owned 1,000 acres in Pasadena. And if you own those today at a million dollars an acre, that's a lot of dinero. So that was one side. And his mother's side married... Uh, was also very wealthy. And those are two combined families with wealth on each side. But this is not uncommon. If you looked at the leaders, uh, the, the kings of the past had, had oftentimes been raised in the, with a military education, been trained, uh, you know, starting at the age of eight years old in fencing when gunpowder came out uh, in small firearms and firearms and hunting. Uh, before that, in jousting, it was a royal occupation. The, 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 the nephews of the king and the, and the sons of the king were involved in jousting. So for Patton to have gone into a, you know, a West Point and, and done uh, very well in, in scholastic and very well in, um, in uh, horseback riding and shooting and going to the Olympics, doing well in football and, and, and uh and other sports. So for him to have gone through that is very normal when you think of the history of generals and leaders. Um, it doesn't all, that's not the case after Pat and the next generation didn't, you didn't have to come from a military family. You didn't have to be affluent. You could go in based on a test score and get accepted to a military school. And then you got an education that was paid for. So maybe first comment on, on some of those things I shared, then we'll move into uh, MacArthur. Okay, uh, certainly in terms of, of um, uh, moving into the officer corps, uh, you know, it's interesting you say that because it, I took a, a test a long time ago, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, um, and my scores indicated I should have been an officer or could have been. You know, that's where my interests were, my intellect, my psychosocial skills and that sort of thing. Um, but the bottom line for me was I got more out of being a non-commissioned officer than I would have ever gotten out of being an officer. Non-commissioned officers are in touch with the troops. The military rides on the backs of NCOs. They get the job done. Their commanders, other than at the field level, which are the captains, 
first lieutenants and second lieutenants, some and majors sometimes, but you, lieutenant colonel and above, those are general. They're moving towards staff, and if they're lucky, they're going to be they're going to get to colonel or maybe to brigadier general, uh, and then they're going to you know they're going to have command of fill in the blank. Uh, so yes, certainly in terms of if we look at the history of man. Uh, in terms of this particular issue, and we can go all the way back to uh, ancient Greek, Greece, and ancient Rome. Uh, certainly, that pattern of of service to the state. Now, that's a deliberate deliberate remark on my part. Service to the state. It was part of the expectation for those who were members of the ruling elite, the educated elite. Remember that that filthy word plagiarism today means you're a bad person. But 300 years ago or 200 years ago, if you plagiarized someone, they knew you had because everybody used the same lingua franca among the educated elite, either Latin or ancient Greek. So if you read something that quoted something you had written, you read it in your original writing, which was either Latin or ancient Greek. And you said, well, thank you for using my words because you enhanced my argument. Uh, so this idea of service to the state has been a part of the human cultural experience. I don't care where you are, Africa, Asia, North America, South America, among the Hivaro Indian Indians of South and of Brazil, uh, you know the legendary head hunters and that sort of thing, uh, the Aboriginal peoples of, of of Australia and New Zealand, New Zealand. You look at Maori culture, for example, and you'll see the same thing that they are the members of who the members of the family, particularly males are expected to be conversant and capable of the war arts. Now, why is this? Go to Cain and Abel. That's how far back I'm going to go. Mm -hmm. Go to Cain and Abel. That was really the first war. And I just came, I just, <laughs> as we're talking, I just realized that it's, that was the first war. Abel had something Cain wanted and he was willing to kill to get it. Hold that thought. Um, we just come up against our, our time here. We're gonna click off on this and we're gonna come back and, and, and do a bit more. So thank right. you, be right with you. Okay. Come on.